Hi, everybody. My name is Armando, and I am a school psychology student at the University of Utah. Uh, I'm in the PhD program there. Um, and we're going to be talking today about something near and dear to my heart. Um, I was a former teacher in the New York City, um, New York City Department of Education. I worked in the Bronx for three years. Um, and my experiences there led me to here. Um, where I am, and this is going to be um, what my dissertation is eventually about and working on self-care for teachers. Um, not to say that I left the teaching profession because, um, I mean, it is a difficult job. We all know that working in education is extremely difficult. Um, but I think my journey in those three years and fine-tuning all those self-care strategies to get me to a place individually that's sustainable um, has led me to thrive in a PhD program while I'm working and juggling all these different balls. We're even looking at buying a house that's neither here nor there, but a lot of things up in the air uh, for me personally. And I just wanna be able to share the notes on my journey and hope that you could take something from it because it's a profession that is <laughs> ripe with burnout, a lot of stress, um, and it's imperative. And I think that's one of the big takeaways that I want you to take away from the, this presentation, just how imperative it is um, that we take care of ourselves and present ourselves with a clear mind um, in all roles, but especially, um, especially professionally. I see that y'all um, have your videos off and that actually coincides perfectly with something that I always like to say um, during my presentations. Um, I struggle with Zoom calls, um, especially with, um, with a lot of my sensibilities and some of my neurodivergence. Um, I struggle with you know, having my camera on and paying attention and it's very distractible when we're at home or in alternate settings. So, feel free to just listen to my voice. The slides, there's not, it's not chock full of information. You know, as a former teacher, I can appreciate the overloading of so much stimulus that I think back to my PDs and that was the last thing that I wanted. Um, so hope that my voice is soothing, that you can listen to this with the video off, maybe on a walk, maybe lying down, maybe sitting. Wherever it is that you're comfortable, just I'm happy that you're able to share this time with me. So putting your oxygen mask on for self-care for teachers. And we've heard that metaphor so often that it be, it's become a cliche. Um, and I'm here to kind of, so I want to radically challenge what putting that oxygen mask looks, really looks like. Um, and so for my first, as an introduction to orient us, I have a picture here um, as I was preparing for this presentation, I have a picture here of my sixth grade teacher. Now I'm 35 years old. Um, so that was a long, long time ago. Um, but as I was preparing this presentation, um, I thought about him a lot. And I thought about, you know, our roles, in schools, you know, what I'm doing in a school, what I did as a school, uh, in schools as a teacher, um, and just who he presented himself to be when he was a teacher. Now, I, as I alluded to before, I have a plethora of things going on for me. And as a child, I had a lot of internalizing problems. I am a chronic skin picker. I have um, OCD, ADHD, tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, and I'm not great around people as well. It wasn't until sixth grade when I met Mr. Lagerman where I started to really come out of my shell. And we learned a lot in the classroom. And I remember we learned about the five paragraph essay and just how to structure our writing. But what I took, that what the, the lesson that I took from him, he was always his authentic self. He never let whatever was going on outside of the classroom in his own personal life, it was, he felt like a person, like a real person. And the culture that he created in that classroom has had a ripple effect on my life 
to this day during this presentation. And it's allowed me to really continue to shine and be my, un, my authentic self. And this is actually a picture of him. After he retired, he moved to Panama. And this was before the pandemic. Um, but he was actually talking to students back in our little town in New Jersey, um, delivering a lesson on the Panama Canal. He loved history, he loved geography. Um, but I wanted to introduce this, not so much to talk about him, I could spend an hour talking about him and the lessons that I learned, but as an opportunity for you to reflect on how you're presenting yourself in the workplace. Are you your authentic self? How can you become your authentic self? And this is gonna be what we get into over the course of this presentation, because that to me is the biggest form of self-care. I struggle immensely in different settings, feeling like I have to put on different masks. Of course, the tone is gonna be a little bit different during a presentation on Zoom or in person, in class, tone and the words might be a little bit different, but I feel like myself. Um, and he always presented that. So I want us to really think about that as an example and how, it, how we can become more and more of our authentic selves. And so a little bit about me, like I mentioned, um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Utah in school psychology. I have letters behind my name, but more so than the letters is the journey that I've taken to get here. Um, one of the pictures here, I am an avid runner. I'm an avid ultra runner. And actually that's one of the biggest reasons why my wife and I moved out here. It's just the access to trail running. That was actually part of the application process to come out here. Um, and that was born out of self-care strategy that I developed when I started be, when I started teaching. Um, that was the perfect thing for me to really exercise all the energy that I have inside of me and really have time to sit and reflect and really sift through all the mental garbage that we have going on. And the more and more I did it, the more stressed out I would be and the more I would need to do it the better I would feel, the longer I'd be able to run. And so it really just coincided. And we'll go into more some, you know, working with our bodies later on in the presentation. Another thing that I have here, another picture of me, this is me as a little kid when I was in, in Kung Fu, but martial arts. I've gotten back into martial arts um, moving here. Um, I, I've been doing jujitsu for the last couple of years. And that's another way for me to build, to get that mental clarity, but this is through community. And this is through finding like-minded individuals and feeling a part of something where it's great if we feel it in the workplace, it's great if we feel it with our coworkers, but we might need to look elsewhere to find a sense of community. And that's there's different ways for us to do that. And again, I'll go more into that a little bit later. Um, and here, there's a picture of my great grandfather and me when I was a little kid. Um, and that goes tied into that community piece. You know, I mentioned OCD and ADHD, how I struggle in a lot of different settings, but I experienced a lot of trauma as a kid. You know, I, I experienced there was a, for a stretch of, of my life, I lived out of my car then later on. Um, and I didn't have that support network. I didn't have that community. My great grandfather was always there and, until he passed away. Um, but despite all these things, I'm still here, I'm still thriving. It can be done. I, and that's why I really wanted to get into this because it's one thing for somebody, oh, school psychology, PhD student talking about all these strategies. This is the power that I have in the therapeutic space. And this is what I can offer here is I am in the struggle with you. I get it. And I have gone through so many iterations of struggle and figuring it out. And then it goes south again. And then that whole journey is what I can offer you. And again, take some of the, the take some of the, the, the notes that I have to offer and see how it resonates in your life. As far as the other picture, 
I'm really big into meditation. I'm really big into mindfulness. And that's not to say that running martial arts or meditation is a one size fits all solutions to self care. It's funny because one of the, uh, a couple of days ago, a friend of mine came to me and asked me some, Armando, I have some fitness questions for you. Um, I have a lot of, I have some questions. I have some specific questions um, about what recommendations you have. And I said, people are messy. You know, what works for me might not work for you, but all I can offer is all these different options of things that I've tried and see what resonates with you. And so again, to orient us through this presentation, I want, this is more of a time for reflection and the nature of Zoom and the nature of how this presentation was structured. I was, I was confined and limited in some aspects. I wanted it to be a little bit more collaborative, but I work with what I'm given. And that's another thing that we'll touch on uh, in the presentation. A lot of big picture, a lot of big picture topics um, that might be, that might feel a little bit um, overwhelming and vague at times, but I invite you to the words and the, the, the thoughts that I share, how, it, how you reflect on it, what comes up for you as, we say, as, as I say these things. And so the next, um, the next slide, what I wanted to do is I actually, in being my authentic self, um, I wanted to share a, the Instagram post actually, that I wrote on the last day um, as a teacher. Um, this was three years ago, right, right before I started this program. And when I left, I didn't know that I was going to become a school psychologist. I just knew I felt compelled to take this next step in my journey. And so I made this Instagram post and it was then that all the I opened up all the floodgates because all my students, they wanted to get my social media handle. And as a teacher, I was not. But now that I left, I then opened up all the floodgates. And so this was the first post then that they saw upon following me after that last day of school. And this is what I wrote on that day. And again, I invite you. I don't necessarily want you to put yourself in my shoes, but think of the emotions and the thoughts that come up for you as I read this. So this is what I wrote, and this was the picture um, accompanying that post. So finish lines. This school year has been marked by finish lines. During the year, I completed two half marathons and almost PR'd in the process. Now that's personal record for those that aren't uh, with the running lingo. I ran my second ever marathon and then my third, and oh yeah, my first ultra marathon which is where this picture was taken. But the most important finish line was the end of this school year, which also marks the end of my teaching career. My first day of teaching as a wide-eyed and bushy-tailed rookie, I of course decided to read, oh, the places you'll go to my students. See, I'd been through some stuff in my life and figured this book was exactly what these kids from the Bronx needed. Just some inspirational stand and deliver kind of stuff but I wasn't really prepared for the twists and turns that were coming for the next three years. I came into this job searching for purpose and I certainly found it, but not by teaching these students how to ace standardized tests. No, I needed to listen to them, connect with them and show them the power of taking risks to follow your dreams and working hard to achieve them. I have a responsibility to each and every one of them to hold up my end of the bargain because maybe they can take something from my journey. I'm not sure where the future will lead me, but I'll, all I know is right now, I want to become the best runner I can be and focus on my true call, writing. Pivoted since then. But more importantly, I'm taking this time to focus on laying the groundwork to become the best dad I can be. That's why I started running and why I became a teacher in the first place. So this goes out to all my students of the past three years. I wasn't the teacher I wanted to be, but that doesn't mean my work is over. It's the same feeling every time I cross a finish line. This is just the beginning for you and me. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Now, as I read that, I had no idea where my life, as I alluded to, where it was gonna go. 
but I stay true to those words, that purpose of connecting. It might not be with those students in the Bronx anymore, but now it's with a lot of students that I work with here in Salt Lake City School District, with a lot of the peers that I interact with in my graduate program, with a lot of the teachers that I work with in the high school that I do, with the professors that I work with um, here during this presentation. Connection is all that we have. And our society, we have so little time to connect. And that's why I started this presentation saying, I'm so grateful that you all took this time to share, to share with me. It's, it's a sacred time that we have to connect. We don't have enough of that. And that I think is the biggest problem that plagues teachers is that connection piece. And anybody who works in education, we are there so much for others but we don't stop and we think about all the particulars of our job, but we don't stop to think. And that's why I started the presentation talking about Mr. Lagerman. We don't think the impact that in a small interaction might have years down the line, decades down the line. And so I really, I really want you here to think about your purpose because everyone who got into education we did it, it, it's not just summers off. That's a nice perk. That's not the main reason. It's not just the modified calendar. There's a good in you that led you to this vocation. And I want you to remember that. Remember that purpose, remember that why that you're here. And that is the biggest thing as we go through and we try to care for ourselves with all the different input and stimulus that we're getting with this profession. If we have our why, there's a saying that I love, he who has a why can bear any how. And I really like that because if we orient ourselves to purpose, the meaning of why we're doing what we're doing, it makes the particulars, it, make, it helps you figure out the particulars a lot easier. And so, in going with the, in continuing with the theme of the presentation, like I said, my, my slides are very bare bones. This is more just time to take a deep breath, unwind, just listen, and just see what comes up. And so I have just very general areas that I would like to touch on. And so the first one is the mind. As I mentioned before, I struggle with intrusive thoughts, chronic skin picker, OCD, ADHD, to the max where sometimes it's really debilitating. And that's part of why I run and as, I'm an, as active as I am because it helps release some of that energy. But finding your clarity of mind is gonna be the biggest help in any sort of situation that you might get into in education. What I mean by that, just think about, think about a time where you were really overwhelmed at work. And it's, it's hard to think straight. It's hard to really delineate one thought from another. It all just meshes into one. And so finding strategies to really help filter those thoughts and be able to see them clearly it's the same way that we need glasses. Some of us need glasses to be able to see a little bit clearer. The more that we're spending time working and not connecting with ourselves and just focused on everything out here, it's harder and harder to think straight. And so for the mind, now I, I, mentioned, I mentioned a few things here. And I think what's the most important thing is having time for yourself and for your thoughts to just marinate a little bit. And now that could look like a formal meditation practice or mindfulness practice, um, which is something that I was definitely a little bit more into um, earlier. Now it's, it's less frequent. I mostly do it in between therapy clients, 
um, just in between each student, just to kind of just as a like erasing an etch a sketch, just uncluttering the mind a little bit. But it could look as like journaling. Journaling is another great way to just sit with your thoughts and externalize them a little bit through through writing. Just anything to help you think clearer. Now this is going to tie into the next one, but running was another great um, great strategy for me. All this pent up energy, all these thoughts, this bundle of knots of thoughts that's so hard to think clearly through, having the time to be able to process that. Maybe you don't have that much time during the day to insert these extraneous tasks because it's just, a, then it feels like another thing on the to-do list, right? Well, then maybe on the drive home, on the commute home and to there, oftentimes we're sitting there in the car and I know this having to commute. I lived in New Jersey while, when I worked in New York City in the Bronx. And my commute was, <laughs> it would average between an hour, 50 minutes, an hour and a half. Um, and at the time, my self-care strategies weren't as tight as they were now, where that time was spent, if I was taking the subway, it was spent doom scrolling or just manically playing on my phone, doing whatever to just entertain myself. Um, but now when I think back, what a wonderful time to sit and be with my thoughts. And oh, if there's traffic on a Friday afternoon on the George Washington Bridge, which is, if you've never been there, it is, it can get heinous, the traffic, um, but what an opportunity it would be. And there were some times that I would be able to achieve that piece sitting in traffic as I'm there waiting to get home. Um, maybe I'm listening to a great podcast, but any time that you can have the mind be still in whatever way works for you. Like I said, human beings are messy. I've presented some things that work for me, but I think it's foolish for many. Um, a lot of times we look at you know, self-care strategies, and it's a big list of all these different things. I look at them as menu items, as buffet items. I don't have all the answers. You have all the answers. I'm just here to try to unlock some of those answers. And so the mind, finding ways to unclutter the mind, maybe it's art, maybe it's writing, maybe it's being more active in running, Maybe it's finding stillness in your day through meditation, yoga, or maybe maybe not as physically active, but maybe going for a walk. But finding time for your mind to sit still, and that is not doom scrolling through social media. There's a time and a place for that, sure. But having some time to be able to actually unwind. Not sitting there watching Netflix. Sometimes that's helpful and necessary if there's a particularly good series that's come out. Maybe on HBO, if y'all are Last of Us fans, I hear that that's the new one. Um, but finding, finding ways to just be with your thoughts. It's such a, an important aspect of self-care, of just giving the mind some time to unwind. Like I said, if you don't want to insert something in your to-do list, that's something that I also struggled with for a long time, then maybe find organic opportunities throughout your day and really just succumb to the quiet. The other piece, as I alluded to, is the body. You can work inside out or you can work outside in. The more we take care of our body, it's, it's just like a loop. The more that we take care of our body, our mind starts to calm down. And likewise, when we take care of our mind, the body and all those aches and pains, they start to go away too. What's really interesting is a couple of years ago, I went on a meditation retreat, a 10-day silent meditation retreat. Um, 
Now I was, I had just finished my first 50 mile race. Now my second ultra marathon at that point, this was right after I left, right when I was applying to grad school, um, grad school the second time around. And I just finished the 50 mile race and my body was pretty sore, pretty beat up. Um, but I still had all this pent up energy. I was still active and I wanted to go, 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 go. And when I went to the meditation retreat, I, I took it on as a challenge. It was something that's always been on my bucket list. I've always wanted to challenge myself, my limits, 10 days of no talking, no writing anything down, waking up at 4 a.m., meditating for most of the day. What was, I, I needed to exercise. I needed to do these things. What was interesting, as sore as I was after the race, as the mind calmed down, all those aches and pains started to go away. Now I know what you might be thinking. Well, 10 days, of course, it's gonna, it's, you're, you're gonna start recovering. But the rate of recovery was extremely different. It was, I almost felt like an X-Men, like Wolverine, just quickly healing um, after that race. But that mind-body connection for sure is there. And it works the other way around. And this is what this section is about. The more we take care of our bodies, it's the hardest thing to do is to, the hardest part of any run, the hardest part of any workout is getting the workout clothes on or getting the running shoes on. But once you do that, the body starts feeling good, the mind starts feeling good. And there's just this, this connection between the two. And it's very, especially in a high stress profession, it's very, very easy to neglect the body. And I know this from personal experience. Before I was a teacher, I worked in another high stress profession, the restaurant business. I was working 70, 80 hours a week on my feet for most of the time. And my habits were atrocious. Eating habits, exercise habits, drinking habits, everything was just my sleeping habits. Everything was off. That was one of the biggest improvements I made going into education was finding and building from the ground up those little habits to start because I didn't know even know where to start here. I was a mess in the restaurant industry. I was a mess for a good chunk of my life. But in working through the body, little by little, it started giving me that just a sliver of calm. And it started like a snowball going down a hill. It just started gaining momentum and gaining momentum. And that first run that I went on was absolutely brutal. It was terrible. I was, a tr it was just, it was so messy. And I just remember the pain of it, but I did it and it got easier. And little by little, it just got easier. And little by little, then I started doing more and more and more. And again, it doesn't have to be running. Maybe an area of opportunity might be your wake up routine your before bed routine, your diet, all these things that we know, we know all these things. I'm not here to lecture you about these things. I'm here to invite you to reflect and think about how can I be 1% better tomorrow? Because I guarantee you, you compound that 1%. Over time, you're gonna be in a better place. You don't necessarily see that transformation from one day to the next, but it's every day you chip away at it, chip away at it, chip away at it. As you could probably tell by now, I love analogies. And for those of you that have watched Shawshank Redemption, I always, I love using that movie as a, as a metaphor for this. That poster that he had in his, in his jail cell, he was he kept on chipping away at it behind the poster, chipping away at it. And your habits, especially when it comes to do with the body, you're not going to reap those benefits immediately, but it's later on. 
don't set out to change everything from the get-go, how can I be 1% better tomorrow? And the next day, how can I be 1% better the next day? Again, maybe it's just your wake-up routine. This is something, even just a few weeks ago, we're all on this journey together. Just a few weeks ago, I noticed that my wake-up routine, there was something slightly off about it. I was using my cell phone as an alarm clock. Now, it was being a different room, and that was another micro-adjustment that I had made from months past where I can't have the cell phone in, the bedroom, in, in my bedroom when I'm sleeping because I am so laser. I, I, I feel the pull of it. I want to be playing around in it, and it's hard for me to sleep. So I in another room, but I use the alarm clock to wake me up. But then when I wake up, well, that's then the first thing I look at, my cell phone. And all of a sudden, before I know it, it's an hour after I woke up and I'm still on my phone. That has a ripple effect on the rest of the day. I guarantee you, it does for me. I, and I'm, I'm sure to varying degrees, it's gonna affect y'all as well. And so I bought one of these like sunrise alarm clocks that little by little to simulate the sunrise, it starts lighting up, lighting up, lighting up. And at a certain point, you can have some sounds go off. I think I have birds chirping now. I'm usually up before the birds start chirping. Um, they're simulated birds, not actual birds. Um, but that's what I'm talking about when I talk about the body. All these things, we don't, we often, it's so easy to get lost in the particulars of the job, to not think about these things. But creating the systems and creating the habits around the functions of the body, drinking water, so important. We forget so often, like how there's, a, there, there's, there's some times where I, I feel particularly, I find myself, one of my big, I notice is when I start picking at my skin, picking at the, the, the skin on my fingers. And again, I am chronic, I'm so bad, but that's a real marker for me when things are starting to get a little bit hairy. And I've noticed that sometimes I just need a tall glass of water and that does it. But we're so lost in everything that's outside of us that we forget those basic things. And so I wanna call attention to that. It doesn't have to be like the pictures that I have here, or the stories that I have about running ultra marathons or going to jujitsu Monday through Thursday or playing pickleball as I see is one of the popular sports in Utah, which I love by the way love being active and love doing all these things, but taking care of our bodies, the effect that it has on our minds and who we are when we enter the workplace is just profound. It's tremendous. And so again, I, I want to call attention to that because it's so easy to ignore. Um, it's, one of the, it's one of the most important aspects, mind, body, all these things and how they play into each other um, to the utmost importance. The next is the best I can do because there's gonna be a lot of different definitions for this, but the next, as you can probably surmise, is gonna be the spirit. And that might, there's gonna be different definitions. Everyone's gonna have, it's an individual definition to that for me. Or call, what I get called to when I think about spirit is I think about the connection between all of us, like I was talking about, and being connected to something else outside of us, community, a higher power, whatever it is, having that sense of connection and camaraderie, it's so easy to get lost and siloed when we're working and feel like an island, but creating moments, authentic moments of connection. And you feel it somewhere else. It's not like I feel it like when I run, I feel it in my calves or my thigh, it's somewhere else. And that, that is, 
for me, there's a reason, mind, body, spirit. Three peas in a pod, they each go together. And for me, maybe it's fam, for, for, for some, maybe it's family time. For me, it's having that time with my coworkers. Yeah, sometimes we're working and sometimes we're in the particulars of the job, um, but it's those authentic moments of connection, sitting down and having a conversation. It's those moments, maybe in passing, maybe when we're in Starbucks grabbing our cup of coffee or swig as I'm seeing is the big thing here and biz. Um, it's the people that we connect with. We oftentimes feel so separate and alienated from each other, but I like to turn one of my favorite mindfulness teachers. He has this practice where he's, and this might resonate with, with folks in Utah with how much we love the outdoors, but we go on hikes and we see all the trees. I'm gonna paraphrase because it's a long quote, but I'm gonna paraphrase the sentiment and hopefully you get something from this, but we go on hikes and we go on walks and we see all these trees and we appreciate the differences of the trees and the beauty of how each tree is different. We don't do that with people. And so he and then I have adopted this practice of I try to turn people into trees where we're all so different, but we're all, we're all human. We come from the same place and acknowledging that and recognizing that and seeing someone for their differences, but realizing that they're no different than me. And all, I have my journey, I have the things that I've gone through, the things that I'm struggling with, the successes, the failures, they have that too, you have that too. And finding ways to connect with that. For some, religion is the answer for that. And that, I, I think that sense of community and that, those, those conversations that that'll elicit are so powerful. For those that don't have religion as something to really um, to lean on in those times of struggle, finding, finding moments and finding communities that you can feel in touch with the spirit. And it's important to talk about these things because a lot of times we, we keep them, we, we are scared to talk about that connection and we can use different words or different phrases in order to convey it, but you know what I'm saying. And the one who knows inside you knows. And whatever it is that that elicits, like I said in the beginning of this presentation, just see what comes up as we talk. What's coming up for you? What do you feel like you need to do to get more in touch with your spirit? For me, Running can also do that. Being outdoors can also do that. And just feeling the immensity of everything around me is just, is imperative to do because it grounds us. And, you know, even things like this, I used to be a hot mess before any presentation, before any talk. Now I'm, because of finding times to insert that. Now, I know, and this is gonna be where now my direct New Jersey sensibilities are gonna shine through a little bit. I think the trickiest thing about working in schools is the different sides of ourself that we have to present. And it's just so tricky navigating the red tape and all that, that is something that I struggle with tremendously. Struggled with it in my teaching, my last teaching job in New, the New York City Department of Education, let me tell you, is one of the most bureaucratic bodies that I've ever, that I've ever seen. Um, but I think here with these other three pieces, 
when we then enter this space, once we have that solid sense of self, who we are, we have that mental clarity, we worked on our body and continue to work on the little habits to get our body feeling better and have that cycle between body and mind, have that running on all cylinders, have the community, the spirit piece taken care of as well, feeling like we're all connected and feeling that true empathy and radical love for each other, for the other human beings that we're going to be sharing a space with. This is the big thing. I have a picture here of one of my other favorite mindfulness teachers. This is Jack Cornfield, if you know him. And he has one of, he has a really good quote that I love. If your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. And to me, that applies directly into education because oftentimes we are given tasks and things to do and we just say yes it's just another thing it's just and we keep on because we want to help the kids the good in us all of a sudden we start to lose that love for ourselves and we give ourselves completely selflessly to others while losing that sense of self and sometimes the biggest act of compassion that you can give for another might be sometimes to say no and take care of yourself. And this is one of the most practical things. If you get anything from this, is one of the most practical things. There is a good chance that, because it's something that even I, knowing this, I struggle with often, is that ability to just say no sometimes to tasks to people, to calls for attention for people, to people who need us. Of course, the good in us wants to help them, but sometimes the best way to help them is to help us. And sometimes it's to say no. Sometimes it's to take a mental health day. Sometimes it's to step away. Sometimes it's not giving your 100% on a task at work. And now waiting for the hoping Washington, Washington County, um, <laughs> people don't come from the district and because this seems antithetical to everything that we we have to be, we have to do everything. No, you don't, you don't. No one's gonna take care of you other than you. There are some tasks that you have to do. It doesn't mean you have to do it to your 100%. Exercise all your energy and put all your energy into that one particular task. Take what you need and discard the rest. And so likewise, even this presentation, I'm, I want to, this was an opportunity for me to model this for you. Because there's a lot of hoops that I need to go through to just putting this together. And, you know, I, I needed to have the presentation proved and all these different notes. And old me would have tried to write all this and just do this to the best of my ability because I need them to say yes. And I want them to think that I'm doing a good job on this presentation. All I can do is be me. I'm speaking from the heart, zero notes. I have the topics and I just, all this information is coming out to me, out of me and to you. Sometimes by doing less, we're actually doing more and we're able to be more present. Mr. Lagerman, like the example that I, that I gave early on, he would frequently go to class and just nothing. He would just talk about the stories, the history. I am not a big history. I, I, I never liked history, but he made it so engaging because it was just like 
story time. It was like sitting around the campfire. Find your purpose, find your why, find who you are and offer that. And things that don't align with that, you have to do it. I needed to get this presentation approved. I wouldn't have done slides. I would have just wanted to hear from you, talk to you, see where you are, and we'll have time to talk and answer questions and have talk about any wonderings that you have, things that you're working through. That's what I wanted. I wanted this to be a true collaborative conversation. We need to put this together. A perfunctory task, job done. But I didn't stress myself with the particulars. Now, the other piece, ask forgiveness, not permission. This is me being, this is the bad student in me from long ago. But sometimes it's best to just do something. And rather than worry about asking and this and that, sometimes just do it. You'll deal with the ramifications later, but if it feels right in the time, just do it. Because at the end of the day, for all the teachers out there, we have the observations, we have the lesson plans, we have all these structures in place that have a purpose, that serve a purpose. But when the door closes, now this is not to give permission for anybody for any misbehavior, but it's inviting the good in you to come out and color outside the lines. You close that door and you are, you have a blank canvas. And we lose sight of that sometimes. Now, the other piece that I didn't include this, uh, that I didn't include here, that also came up when I was working on this presentation is choose your battles wisely. There's a time and a place sometimes to ruffle feathers, ask forgiveness, not permission. Um, and there's other times where it's just not worth it. A little strategy that I use for me is on a scale of one to 10 of just how stressed out a situation makes me feel. If it doesn't register a seven or above, just drop it. In all likelihood, that's not a situation that you're going to remember a year from now. And so, again, my life is my message. Even this presentation, as we're nearing the end, I wanted to wrap it up. And with all this that was said, to bookend it and read you all, oh, the places you'll go. Now that you're armed with all these things and Put it in the context of your struggles, your journey, the direction that you want to go. That was one of the things that was mixed out of my presentation. Apparently, I have, I have not kept up with it, but Dr. Seuss is not one of the most popular, um, not, a, not a favorable character, a, not a favorable person these days. I, I, I missed that memo. I, have, I had no idea. But in order to be respectful to everybody there, to everybody here, I was told by my supervisor to not include it. And old me would have fought. And I even called it out to my supervisor. I said, you know what? This ties so well with my presentation because old me would have, hey, you know, the message of this book, you know, I know that you have it and this and that, but it doesn't register a seven but it's actually an opportunity to share with you that even now it's just pick your battles wisely. So rather than read it to you and end on that note, I now have an anecdote to share with you in real time of how, you know what, sometimes it's just easier to drop it because if your compassion does not include yourself, it is incomplete. So I would have something else after this, but I don't. Instead, it's just us here. So for the last few minutes, I just wanna open the floor for any questions 
any insights that you have. I know there weren't. You might have come in here looking for specific strategies. I don't have the, all the answers, but I guarantee you that you do. And so I want to give you the floor for any input that you have, any questions that you have. And if not, then you can enjoy the rest of your Friday, but you can use the chat. You can, if you feel comfortable enough, unmute. I will give you the time and space that you need. I am here to answer any questions. If you wanna message me privately and if not, then we can wrap up a little bit early, whatever it is that you feel called to, I am totally okay with. I gotta say it has been an absolute pleasure to share my journey, share my experiences, share my insights. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I'm in it struggling with you in more ways than you may even realize, um, but I hope you got something from it. And thank you for sharing the space with me. Enjoy the rest of your day, enjoy the weekend. So long, everybody.